And welcome to another one of uh, Blandon's Art Talks. Today we'll be chatting with uh, artist Sandra Williams about her uh, exhibit currently located in the second floor gallery of, this, of the Blandon Art Museum. Um, and we'll be doing this uh, meeting uh, via Zoom today. So uh, in a short bit, we'll transition over to that conversation that I've had with the, uh, the artist Sandra Williams. Uh, but again, you know, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel and uh, check us out on Facebook and also our website for any uh, information uh, with uh, concerning the current exhibits that we have going on or any updated information and events that will be happening. Um, one little note that I'll mention is that we will be having a, a reception, a closing reception for this exhibit on December 18th of, uh, of 2021. And uh, that will happen from 2 o'clock to uh, uh, 4.30. So you're all welcome to come down and meet the artist and have uh, uh, conversations with her and just to hear a little bit more about her and her artwork. So thank you again, and uh, we'll turn it over to the interview. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. We're here with uh, artist Sandra Williams. Uh, Sandra, thank you for joining us today here uh, on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Eric. It's yeah, been no, a pleasure. Yeah, no problem. So um, first off, you know, just uh, for our uh, visiting audience and people that are viewing this uh, uh, video on online here, tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself, kind of your background and, and what you're actively doing right now. Well, I've been a professor at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln since 1999 so is that 22 years <laughs> it just seems like a long time um i'm originally from cleveland ohio uh i it's something that comes into my work a lot is uh, you know i have a mixed heritage my mother was from lima peru and you know my father was sort of a scotch irish heritage um just really working class background nothing too fancy he was a police officer she was a nurse mm -hmm. and uh it, it was unusual that i went off to art school you know that, that was unusual for our family yeah were you always interested in art though i was i was and i will say that you know after i did two of my little cousins also went off to art school and became graphic designers so mm -hmm. that is a tendency you know it is something that we have been interested in yeah. it's just that i don't think especially when you come from an immigrant family that's not the first choice that you go into a lot of my cousins went into things like law okay now did uh did they were your parents supportive oh yeah they were um you know i think they always were concerned because it's not a straightforward pathway is it yeah, right. you kind of bounce around but i i was lucky in that right out of undergrad i got a national residency hmm. at the contemporary crafts museum in portland oregon okay. and i think that kind of gave them a sigh of relief like maybe she actually can do something with this they just didn't know but since they were risk takers anyway especially my mother yeah. i think they thought well you know this is her version of risk taking rather than moving to another country she is going to do this yeah and it yeah. worked out <laughs> yeah for sure i think it i think you're doing great so uh, <laughs> and hopefully they're uh, proud of you so um now did your parents have any type of creative activity that they did or? They did. I would cons have considered them both very creative people, though they wouldn't have considered themselves creative. Uh, so, you know, when I was little, we just didn't have a lot of money and you would have a pair of jeans and you'd get kind of bored with them. And, you know, we didn't have money to buy new clothes. So my mother would like embroider flowers and birds all down one leg and you know those were your new jeans yeah. <laughs> and it really it did you know that idea of wearing something that was different made you feel special and my father was very into restoring old cars mm. and so he would like I remember he got this 1966 Buick Skylark that 
you know, just looked like a bucket of bolts when he got it. And I think he got it for $300. Yeah. And I didn't have any brothers. So <laughs> he, he had me help him restore that okay. for years. And then, you know, we painted it cardinal red and eventually put like a white leather rag top, white leather interior on it. And then that was the car that I got for my 16th birthday. Oh, nice. um, so, and I really learned a lot of things from him that people don't consider to be part of art, but things like stamina, mm. things like doing things over and over again until it is right. Mm -hmm. Uh, like all of those things feed very well into art, although he wouldn't have considered himself artistic. No. Yeah. Well, that was that kind of leads into another question I had. It's like how did how did those type of things with your you know your mom doing all that kind of embroidery work on your jeans and you know working with your dad on the, the car, you know how how did that impact your creative endeavors uh, further on, or have you ever reflected on how those little things kind of find themselves in? Yeah. I think that pe people might not know, like when you sit down in the studio, you are there for the long haul. You're there until you can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so like long hours of creative labor, whether it be wet sanding the car, um, taping it off and painting it, making sure it's done right. Uh, and both of my parents were very critical Okay. You know, like, uh, no, it just fail. It just, you know, like you couldn't, you couldn't do it ugly. You had to do it beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, it, well, there was an emphasis on doing things right, yeah. or you're going to do it over again. Uh, but then just the stamina of working on something with your hands for, you know, sometimes 12 hours, but he loved it. And she really liked it. That idea of creative flow where they just got lost in what they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not really taking much of a break, yeah. to continuing to work. And I very much have that mindset when I sit down in the studio where, you know, that you just have to get into it. And the second you're into it, you know, you look up and it's night and you don't know where the day is gone yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. But it's good I, to have dogs so that you like take a break and take they, a walk. Yeah, yeah. They keep you connected to the world. huh? Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, you know, and thinking about that too, you know, a lot of you would, would you consider your work very like um, the bulk of your work tactile or like has this kind of material sense to it? It always has, okay. um, it, it, you know, I am, I'm a texture person. Yeah. The artists that I like make very textural work visually or actual physically. Um, the mediums that I have been engaged with. So I know when you knew me, I was working with resin and colored polyurethane and digging, you know, wood out and using the raised line as a barrier. And um, even now, I need a long concentrated period of time to work on my next series, the chimeras, but they're made on a laser cutter and they're three dimensional and they're lit from inside, but they still have the stories cut out of them and the words come out of them. Um, but, you know, they are meant to be sort of tactile, touched. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's always been a lot of horror vacui in my work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about the, the, the work that's up here at the museum. Um, how did this body of work come about? Okay, so this is a big change from my older work. And in 2014, I did this residency in the Peruvian Amazon at a biological research station that was called CICRA. Um, and it was part of Amazon Conservation Association. And I, I mean, you've known me for a long time and I love animals, I love wildlife. And so I was really going there to 
I was very interested in this one specific type of dog, right? It's not really a dog. It's not really a bear. It's not really a fox. Um, it's like this weird Amazonian dog that I never saw. Um, they're very rare. They're almost extinct. Okay. And, uh, but I saw a ton of other stuff. But as I'm, in, I don't even think I fully knew what I was getting myself into, even though I had researched it a lot. Yeah. Uh, when I went to go make the reserve, you know, the plane reservation and everything to get there, it was like, it's going to take me three days to get to this research station. <laughs> so like there's one day to fly to Peru. Yeah. Then there's one day when you fly to Puerto Maldonado. And then, okay, so that was a short day, but then I had to go and get materials that I couldn't take, you know, bring with me from the United States. Mm -hmm. And then one day was just the motorized canoe down the Amazon, like a seven hour boat ride um, till we got to the station. Yeah. And so you, I was quite deep in, and then a lot of the instructions they gave me made sense. They said, you cannot bring anything toxic with you. Anything you bring in, you have to take out with you. Um, because you know it was very much conservation yeah. and it may be the subtext of the subconsciously maybe i was looking for that because i was working with really horrible toxic materials at the time and i thought i'm going to take watercolor and i'm i had always cut paper and you know i'm just going to cut paper and that's going to be you know then i'm going to come back and paint uh, there were a lot of challenges when Patrick, the station manager, had emailed me. He said, okay, so it's very humid. And so you have to find a way to keep, you know, mold or moss from growing on your paintings mm -hmm. as you're working on them. And the other thing is that insects like to eat paint. So you have to find a way to protect your work while you're working on it. And I went to, you know, we have a great local art supply store, Govan's art supply. And I went to Peggy and I said, what do I do? And she's like, maybe desiccants. And that was a really brilliant idea. And so we got these plastic sleeves and I thought, well, you know, I'll make five or six pieces while I'm there. Um, and then I ordered desiccants and every night, as soon as the piece had dried as much it was, as it was going to, I would put it in the sleeve with the desiccants. And I was interested, like if I cut paper, will that give the insects like a starting point? They never ate any of my work though. Yeah. <laughs> so I started cutting it and leaving it just to see what would happen, just as an experiment. Yeah. Um, but then I realized like how much I loved cutting paper. Hmm. The other thing is historically, when you look at all of those artists, you know, like, you know, Frederick Church or Martin Johnson Heed, who had gone with explorers to the new world. And when they're, especially Martin Johnson Heed, when he's painting hummingbirds and orchids, everything looks so organized, right? Yeah. yeah. Denic, perfect and the jungle is just wild it's a mess and so trying to visually make sense of everything I was taking in uh, but you know I love a mess I, I love all of that stuff <laughs> you know the cut paper really served that very well yeah you know, it was my way of visually organizing you know just looking at silhouette and cutting paper is really just drawing with a knife. Mm -hmm. And did you find that experience kind of a meditative experience? Right? Oh yeah, it is. I love it. Um, I mean, I love painting, you know, as well. And I do not love Illustrator, <laughs> Adobe <laughs> Illustrator. I'm not sure I love that laser cutter, you know, when you put something in there and all of a sudden your paper catches on fire and you're like, oh no. Oh. So there's a lot of, what I do love is, sounds strange, the frustration of experimentation with new oh, yeah. things. Yeah. But with the cut paper, there's, the cut paper has the least amount of frustration with it. It's so direct. Yeah. You know, um, the laser, not so much. <laughs> um, so tell me about the, the stories that you chose to depict. Because in, in, in our gallery, we would have what, two, three different stories 
Well, there's a number of different stories. Like I have several sub themes, but they're all linked with this visual DNA of cut paper. Okay. And so I think my first story where like the ideas come from is this idea of ecotone. So in science, ecotone is traditionally where two different ecosystems overlap. Mm -hmm. So that might be like the grasslands in between the forest and the desert or an estuary, which is, you know, where salt water and fresh water meet. Mm -hmm. um, but where we live, uh, it's where the urban and nature meet okay. and what comes into that, like foxes who we all love and the coyotes who we don't love yeah. because they come into the city and they grab people's pets. Um, and so like now that's a constant fear in my life. Yeah. Um, For you with all your pets, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, you know, there are these problems with, you know, how we live our lives. Well, also it's this idea between like, I take it further, like nature and culture. Okay. Is a metaphorical ecotone in a way. Um, you know, it, and those two are very closely tied you know like there's this idea of nature coming into the cities but we kind of took over their habitat mm -hmm. and um but it also draws this problem with the way we live our lives in contemporary society mm -hmm. like we're I, I don't especially since the pandemic i'm always chained to a computer um and i really i have lost flexibility i have lost muscle just in that year and a half because we are always sitting um and it kind of shows you how unhealthy modern life can be um but the and you know if you've known me for a long time you know i'm a big animal lover yeah and so i'm always looking at you know this these discourses between human and because we're animals, mm -hmm. you know, human and non human animals, and the way that manifests itself like images of animals evolved parallel to images of human beings on cave walls, we see horses and buffalo and um, but it, it particularly not so much in subterranean fires, but in, you know, the Akuku and the other work, certainly, we do have these mythos. Uh, animals become totemic. We like to think that we take on characteristics of animals that we like. And at the same time, and I don't think, I don't think the mongoose or the iguana are in the show, are they? No, I don't I think, think so. I think I, think I brought those back. back. I think you took those back. But I have, um, a series of invasive species uh, that you know we introduce to ecosystems that don't belong there and the havoc that they wreak. Mm -hmm. So there's you know this kind of spiritual and it it's across all cultures. Like think about how the dove is a stand-in for God's love, or you know, how you know different animals just definitely have different significance you know, depending on what culture you're from. Mm -hmm. And I draw upon Peruvian myth and folklore a lot, but then there's also the scientific aspect of it where their DNA is so close to ours that like we can receive blood transfusions from chimpanzees. Um, we can use pig skin or fish skin as a skin graft, if you are burned, if we have to, a lot of times there's human donor skin, but um, I've seen with animals who've been burned in fires, there was this one cat and they grafted fish skin onto it. And it was really like a chimera because that area, it did, it had this, it must've been a big fish because it had like scales. It was really amazing. Um, and I read, an article in the New York Times last week where they have been able to grow a human kidney inside an animal yeah. and they're looking at seeing if that will be a viable transplant option. Yeah. Um, and so 
I think when I'm talking about this difference between nature and culture and what people think is unbridgeable and it's not unbridgeable, like we are very close to them. And, you know, whether that be pets, you know, when we think about the, the association, the attachment that we have with the animals that we share our homes with, or, you know, now we are always watching these uh, natural disasters play out on television or experiencing them. And, you, you know, a lot of times, especially a few years ago when there were all these fires in California and then the bushfires in Australia and the fires in the Amazon. And you're watching these animals just like sort of horrified. They don't know what to do in, you know, in the fire, but then you also realize our fates are linked you know, what, what we're doing to them, we're doing to ourselves. And people might not pick up on that, but it's definitely, there's a lot of my work that's a subtext. Okay. Um, but, you know, in the stories with the Akuku, that the Akuku is very directly a, a Peruvian folklore piece. And it's one about conflict between the people who live in the mountains and the people who live in the rainforest okay. because ultimately it's um a story that's about otherness mm -hmm. and and so it starts off you know the young girl is in the it, it's the opposite of a western fairy tale too right because the young girl is in the um she's watching her llamas she's in the mountains and she sees this handsome man he starts off as a man and then he turns into an animal um and he convinces her to go to the rainforest with him and says oh your life is going to be easy and we'll just eat fruit and everything's going to be great and so finally she's like okay um and she leaves her family and as they go down the mountain he changes into the bear mm -hmm. um, and then she's like you're not the prince i thought you were <laughs> this is not a castle this is a cave um and uh you know, but then ends up, you know, falling in love with him. Uh, but then when she takes him back to the mountains because she misses her family, you know, it's, but a lot of, you know, European fairy tales are pretty awful too, but her parents kill her husband. Oh, really? Well, that's what happens, you know, cause they, they boil him in a pot of water. They eat him? Do they eat him? No, they don't eat him. They just kill him, which is bad enough. Uh, and then she stays there and she thinks sort of about what she's done. Yeah. Um, no one ever says if the parents are remorseful or not. I'm not sure if there are, you know, I don't think that there are, with a lot of Peruvian folk tales, there is usually a subtext of conquest and colonialism because it'll start one way and then when the Spanish come, usually it's transformed into something that's a lot more violent. Yeah. But I think that one was always violent. Yeah. Um, but then, you know, one day she's sitting and she's thinking about it and she sees, when she had her son, he's a bear from the waist down and he's human from the waist up. Huh. But everyone in the village loves him and he's really strong. And to this day, like if you ever go on vacation to Cusco, there are like at the drop of a hat, they have these little processions and festivals and dances. And there is always one that features a bear dancer. Hmm. And that's Pablucho, okay. the, bear, the bear son. Yeah. And, uh, but one day she sees him, he's running towards her, but then he runs past her. And as he starts to run down the mountain, he changes completely into a bear. Oh. And she's left alone. And I'm not exactly sure what the message is. Like, once you start your new family, you, it's probably a for better or for worse type of thing. You yeah. stay with your family or risk the consequences. Um, but, you know, that's, that's why the last panel says, you know, now I must live the rest of my life alone without the two I love most. Hmm. Um, so you're, you're like, that's not happy, but no, I mean, you know, if you, <laughs> like a tra I mean, it's like, you know, but I guess, you know, it could be, it's like, well, you know, at the end, uh, you have it yourself sometimes and you're living within the memories and that you 
that you had. I, I don't know. I, I would have to think a little bit more on like what that story actually means. I think a lot of folk tales that we're used to have been trans. They've been Disneyfied, right? Yeah. They, um, because you know, I think in in Cinderella, they they I think they give the stepmother the shoes that are like red hot the red hot iron shoes and she dances until she falls down dead. Like the original ones are very, they're yeah. not for children. Yeah. I would not, not the Disney versions. It's the, the true original uh, fairy yeah. tales are pretty, pretty horrible. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, but I'm interested in folk tales because they usually do involve that idea of animals. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we go to Dance of the Animal Brides, I'm not sure how I got started on that one, um, but I started realizing like how many cultures had an animal bride. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go, you know, to my father's side, like the Irish, the Irish have the Selkie, mm -hmm. you know, who is a, a seal, but then she can take off her skin and she's a beautiful wo woman. The Japanese have the crane wife, you know, in India, there's a monkey wife, um, but all the, there's a, a dog wife, a cat wife, you know, so there's this idea of women sort of being closer to nature. Mm. Um, and all the stories are really similar. Like usually the, you know, the, the man sees that when she can transform into a human and it's always a beautiful woman and he takes the feathers or he takes the skin so that he can bring her back. And, you know, they live together and she seems fine, but one day they always find their skin mm. and they put it back on and they return to the wild. Mm. And dancing is also very much a part of those stories, which I think is really interesting. And, and so that one is sort of like wrapped up in ideas of freedom and, um, you know, really wondering why there are all these stories about women being close to nature and things like that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there are those type of stories where I am very interested in folklore. And, you know, what is that discourse? How does that connect with women? Because that piece in particular started getting me to read about the history of women and witches mm -hmm. in Europe. Yeah. Um, because, you know, a lot of them were midwives, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> but then there are other actual stories, just stories that I knew about for a long time and just never did anything with. So Subterranean Fires is a true story. Yeah. That actually happened in Southern Ohio, like back in the, you know, when Ohio was being settled and all of those coal mining companies were company towns. Mm -hmm. So you were never going to be able to leave. You were basically just a different type of indentured servant. And I think I was thinking about that piece because um, there was just a lot of, the, it was made during a period of history, you know, in the United States when there was just a lot of rage. Yeah. You know, there, there were, like I remember St. Louis, you know, there were always, not riots, but violent protests in cities. Um, you know, we've the past decade has really been full of protests. Mm -hmm. You know, the pipeline, and you know, and it, it it just made me think. Well, that's kind of always been here. Yeah, and that's a, a historical thing. Are we getting worse? Are things changing for the worse? It's like, well. We've always been this way. There are just more people now. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, and social media connects everybody quicker, and the stories get spread quicker. Whereas, mm -hmm. like with this, you know, the fires in Ohio, those were by locally known stories that eventually got out through the news. But you know, not everybody was literate, and, and it just took a longer time for that story to get out. But I yeah. think you're, I think you're right about how that whole body of work kind of kind of sums up what's been happening at least within the last couple of years you can say it's like you know yeah there's undercurrents of of subterranean fires that's been going on 
Um, yeah. So. I, I started that, I started um, these two sketchbooks, you know, that I, Peggy Gomez had given them to me for Christmas. One was black and one was white. Mm -hmm. And so one was supposed to be my kind of stories of hope. But oddly enough, my stories of hope were these ink drawings of protests. Mm -hmm. And she gave me those books probably in 2014 or 2015. Okay. And so, um, you know, one of my protests was actually in Mexico when those 42 young men who were studying to be teachers were, you know, kidnapped by a cartel and, you know, the corrupt police had been involved, but there are all of these people who are saying, you know, where are they? Um, I have some pipeline protests in there, but yeah, that one is filled, that little book is filled up with ink drawings of protests okay. through several years. Yeah, and um, is that going to be a future uh, project then, you think? Or? No, I think that was something that I just, I always keep active sketchbooks usually to figure out what I'm doing, okay. um, but you know that one was like a someone makes you two handmade sketchbooks yeah. like you've kind of got to do something focused with it but um i don't really like i digress and jump around a lot in terms of the way my process metamorphoses into different processes yeah. and i think that's enough change and also the animals are really like I have this long history of research of folk tales, human animal bond, you know, the way we live with animals, nature, ecological disaster, in extinction, you know, type of things. Like I can't get started on a different discourse about the history of protests. So that was just like a fun thing that I did for me. Now, how did the, um, so how, did, how does the work start? Do they start by you cutting out or do you have like a rough draft drawing or like what is the progression towards the end result? Do I have my sketchbook here? Um, I always have really, uh, where is, it? it's usually right here. Um, and I would have thought that I would have had it with me. It must be in the living room, how weird. But um, I, I actually, I don't know where the ideas come from, mm. you know. I'm always reading something, that's part of it. Like, you know, when I was thinking about um, how we can receive, or they've started to grow human organs and animals for transplants. Like that was something I read last week that might find its way into a piece of work, not in a literal form, but like years from now. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I remember seeing a lot of the Akuku images back in 2012, but didn't start working on that piece until 2015 or 2016, I don't think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, what the process of making a piece is I do draw and draw and draw and kind of plan it out uh, ahead of time, plan out the composition. But then now, because you know, I've started some new pieces, but behind me, like when I was at Arctopia is when I made Dance of the Animal Brides. Okay. And this was the first one that I made after I had drawn it. Yeah. And then of course that wasn't enough. So I did it again. And it's, it's not unusual for me to make a piece, be unhappy, you know, even after all that drawing to make a piece, be unhappy with it and make it again, even if it takes another hundred hours um, because it has to be done right. That's my dad. Yeah. I know, like, this isn't right. Uh, so like Pablucho, in in the akuku series the one where the boy is half bear like yeah. i had already completely made that piece okay. and had spent 85 90 hours on it and i was like this is just this you know i was so unhappy with it and i just started it over <laughs> it goes faster the second time yeah. um because you know what you're doing yeah. 
but you you know your hands remember you know how to make those cuts they make them better the second time but i don't always want it to be super refined um so I will have an idea kind of bouncing around my head sometimes for years and I'll have a few false starts, you know, so for right now, when, when I had the residency in Key West, you know, I was really interested in the shipwrecks, the history of shipwrecks okay. and coral reefs off of the Florida Keys. Yeah. Um, but I was just thinking about it as an ecological story. What I wasn't expecting to think about was the history of slave ships that had wrecked off of Key West. And there was this one about the Henrietta Marie. And, you know, there, I think at the time they were remaking The Little Mermaid and there was all this controversy because they were going to make The Little Mermaid black and people were like, oh, oh. And I'm like, well, actually that makes sense because I think mermaids, and part of their origin might be in um, some African religions. Like I know they have a lot of water goddesses like Oshun uh, and Yemaya, Yemaye, Yemaya, I think it's Yemaya. Mm -hmm. um, these, you know, and they are sort of ocean entities. Um, but that image isn't really coming together. Sometimes I have questions of authenticity, like, you know, if this is going to be about that narrative, you know, as a Latinx person, what right do I really have to comment on African American history? You know, if you make this piece, are you just making it for yourself? But my personal point is, it's probably because I haven't put the ecological part in there. Okay. And there is going to be that dimension, it just hasn't come to me yet. Okay. But that you know, I've been thinking about that piece for almost two years now, yeah. and I have some false starts. Right. Uh, and they never just come out, you know, <laughs> they take, they actually take years to figure out. Simmering in the brain and, you know, there the is. images and simmering no more. And... But I always have, you know, my fingers and different pies, Sandra pie hands. <laughs> um, so like right now, um, you know, I, I teach that big street art class. And so I, I always kind of wondered, well, where, what are you going to do with your scholarly work on street art? And then it turned out that my friend Tammy, who um, teaches in the honors program, was like, oh, presented the pop, there's like a big academic popular culture conference. Mm. And so, you know, I presented my paper on memorial walls last year and I was contacted by a publisher. And it had always been a fantasy of mine to like write a book about yeah. street art. And then here, it, they're like, be careful what you ask the universe for, <laughs> then you're gonna have to do it. Um, and I was thinking, what do I really have to say about this subject? And it turns out a lot. <laughs> Well, that's so you're writing a book, Sandra. I'm, I'm writing a book, and uh, you know, so I have that project going on. You know, I have an upcoming show in, you know, on the chimeras in Las Vegas, and I have you know one in Mexico, and uh, so I'm always working on something. Usually, it's something that has as long as I have projects going on, I'll get to all of my ideas eventually. Yeah. It just takes time. Yeah. Well, good. Well, uh, let's kind of go on here. It's like, um, who are your, who would you say are your biggest uh, influences in terms of your artwork? Like artistic influences? Yeah, I'd say, I mean, we talked about your parents a little bit and having a little bit of influences. I mean, artistically, you know, some writers. Uh, I mean, who are, I mean, who are this, is, this is the thing. If I am absolutely honest, my biggest influence is probably Linda Berry, the cartoonist. Okay. The writer and cartoonist. So she did like 100 Demons. And when I was growing up, um, she did, she had this, Car free weeklies that was called Ernie Pook's comic. And it was about like 
Marlis and Freddie, and they were these little vignettes, these little stories that were kind of sad. Hmm. And in a way, when I look back at that, you know, one of the things that resonated with me was, you know, she was Filipino American. Mm -hmm. And I think growing up as, you know, sort of biracial in Cleveland, um, you know, that was the only narrative that I was hearing that was even remotely like my own. Mm -hmm. And so I was really fascinated by that. And then, and then when you think about it and you think about images with words. Oh yeah. Right. Oh yeah, of <laughs> course. Like some of her, if I'm honest, my biggest influences are gonna be some comic book artists. And the other one would be Los Brothers Hernandez who are from Los Angeles and they did the Love and Rockets comic books in the eighties and nineties. And you know, that was a Chicanic storyline. There was an LA storyline that was also punk rock. And when I was young, I was kind of into that. Yeah. And um, then there was like a Mexico storyline. Okay. And so like those were big influences. I think in terms of, I did grow up in Cleveland and they have a huge, like one of the most venerable museums in the United States, the Cleveland Museum wow. of Art is still free to the public to this day. Mm -hmm. And I spent a lot of time in that museum as a kid. And also I went to the Cleveland Institute of Art, you know, you know, as a little kid, as a high school student, wow. you know, as a, you know, college wow. student, certainly. And so there are two pieces. There's Henri Rousseau's surprise. And when you, Think about it like all of the vegetation, the tiger, um, he does a lot of stuff with buffaloes and monkeys, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. And then there's another one, George Bellows, the ash can painters, stag at sharkies. But when, you, you know, the boxers okay. and his ability to create this illusion, like there's a spotlight on the two fighters. But the other thing about those works is all of his boxers like there's the boxing going on in the ring but the real animals are in the crowd when you look at pieces people's faces they're bestial you know they're yeah. screaming they're enraged and yet they're dressed up kind of fancy yeah you know, like an evening of entertainment um I think there was also like Susan Rothenberg's dancers that for years I thought it was a giant crab and it terrified me, but you know, I used to just stare at that painting. Um, you know, and then I think, you know, I used to love Gustav Bure, man William Hogarth, even as a kid. I liked the pop. Okay, now that I'm older, I will admit, you know what? In theory, if not in image, Keith Haring was actually a huge influence on okay. me. Not necessarily, you know, because of the little dancing figures or the simplicity of his work, but because he would do things like open up the pop shop in New York, yeah. where all of his work, like he would make bags or buttons or t-shirts, and it was ex the accessibility of his work yeah. was a huge, like I loved that idea. I embraced that idea. Um, so, you know, I think, oh, because there's, there's another thing about other artists that I'm currently looking at right now. Yeah. Um, I love David Shrigley <laughs> just because he makes me laugh. Um, he also makes me kind of mad. Do, do you know his work? No, I don't. It, so simple but then he'll write something on it and it's always hilarious okay, okay. and then he'll sell a screen print for fifteen thousand pounds and i'm like <laughs> i wish i thought of that <laughs> um, but no he never fails to make me laugh when i look at his work he make you know his work makes me happy um i love billy Beatty, the quilt the african-american quilt artist who does all of the portraits um I admire Nicole Fleetwood. Uh, she just won a MacArthur grant for the work that she does in prisons. Um, I love Daisy Ginsburg. Uh, uh, these are all people that make me feel really bad about myself because I'm like, oh, they're so brilliant. Um, 
I look at a lot of street art okay. and I'm going to say, yeah, that's a big part of it too. Roa has always been a favorite of mine and, you know, two people that I really love and I'm writing about right now are Saner and Inti. Hmm. Saner is from Mexico and Inti is from Chile. Yeah. Uh, and they, they have some really, you know, Saner is doing all of this video mapping so that when he has works in galleries, like there's digital work that reacts to people who are coming in. And I love that interactivity yeah. and this kind of indication of where street art is going into immersion. Um, but with the scale of it, like street art tries to immerse you in experience at first with the scale, like the side of this enormous building. Um, but then going into digital word worlds, Okuda is doing something similar. Mm. And then Inti just simply because of the way um, I, I feel a real simpatico with him because he kind of mixes stories of colonialism, but he's very interested in um, the way people create magic, whether that's through religion, whether that's through, you know, there are different religions, but I'm also thinking about the prevalence of dolls in South America and how you know that kind of the magic realism of the writers is actually this sort of thing that pervades life. Mm -hmm. um, I was just talking about this with some people the other day like there's a little figure called the Akeko yeah. uh, and you know people will put it in a, a you know a respected place in the home and the Akeko is this doll that is supposed to bring you abundance and good luck mm. but you also have to do things for him like you have to give him a cigarette and you have to provide like a little shot of alcohol and bring him food that he likes but you know what you know there are aspects of a number of religions that, you know, where you have to think about the festivals with the Virgin Mary, where you have to like give money and stuff like that. Yeah. And Inti is very interested in like those kind of systems of belief mm -hmm. and how they're not so different, you know, how they're, they're more related. And so I really like him right now. It sounds like you got a great kind of uh, dictionary of or an encyclopedia of, of different artists that you kind of reference and pull from. And, uh, yeah, you, you know, um, I think that I've always been really lucky. You know, I, you know, my mother was a voracious reader, so we always, and we would go to these library sales. Yeah. Um, and like the Cleveland Library, where you could take home a bag of books for a dollar. And you know, she went for the expensive book. So we did have a lot of art books. We also had this, um, an entire set of encyclopedia of animals okay. that I used to love wow. looking at as a kid. Um, we would have Hans Christian Andersen fairy tales, but like a really old book that had actual prints right. for illustrations. And so I think a lot of these things and then kind of growing up in a city where we had that big museum available yeah um kind of gave me a route and then you know very early on I was really lucky to have been had the London Paris class handed down to me mm. you know uh and to be able to spend three weeks a, you know a year in some of the world's great museums and actually like see the things that I had studied, but maybe didn't have resonance with me as a young person yeah. because seeing a piece in person um, and then kind of like learning more about world history through paintings, uh, uh, but always able to find things that resonated with me. Yeah, yeah. that's good. So um, skin towards the end here, what is the, um, what is the best piece of advice that you ever been given and would give to other artists? The best piece of advice I wish I could follow because <laughs> it was actually a collector and he said, the artists that are the most successful treat themselves like a brand. Mm. And so like they have a way that they present themselves 
public and you know even on their social media everything is very controlled and i'd like here are pictures of my dogs along with my art you know so i don't really edit things out yeah. i'm like oh hey look at my garden look at these you know so i really i mean i I guess like crazy dog lady is probably part of my brand that if I wanted to be more successful, I would have edited that out. No, I, um, I think that's your brand, Sandra. I, I, why, edit, why edit your brand? <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't it be better to just be like, oh, here's this, you know, I think that people, this interview that we're doing right now, people rarely get that part of it because I'm always talking about my dogs when I really have so much more to say. Um, so you know but if i were going to have i would have probably more carefully cultivated my brand yeah. well there's still time to find a few <laughs> no i think you have to do that when you're young right uh, but you got I didn't, I didn't grow up with this whole branding idea so now i'm just kind of stuck with like funky shoes crazy dog lady that's your brand <laughs> that's what it is that's fine it be, I'm okay with it. yeah it could be worse though sandra it could be worse yeah it could be like the smell you know <laughs> so, like, that would be a worse brand to have i would say yeah that would probably be worse <laughs> yeah. all right so the last question that i ask uh every artist that i do is you know what does it mean for you to exhibit at the blandon well i feel really lucky to have an exhibit at the blend in for a number of reasons. It's a beautiful collection. And really, like when I looked into that gallery and there's the Faith Ringgold holding there, yeah. like that means something to me as an artist. I have loved Faith Ringgold, you know, since I was in college and first learned about her. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is really so meaningful. But also, you know, like I said, that the Cleveland Museum of Art was really important to me as a kid, especially as a kid who didn't have a lot of resources. Yeah. And so to be able to contribute, you know, to the legacy of a museum, even with just a show, and to, you know, kind of provide this glimpse to other people, particularly kids, because um, my work is fairly family friendly. Um, you know, that's, I think that's really important to me too. Um, you know, so I love the diversity of that collection. Like I didn't know about Minnie Adkins before I came there and now I'm obsessed with her. I'm like I have to have one of the possums with the baby possums hanging off the tail. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I just kind of, you know, when a museum offers you an exhibition, you feel really embraced by that opportunity and then you know i had the opportunity to learn about new artists i you know was really had a very emotional moment with the faith ringgold so part of what it means to me can't exactly be put into words yeah. um, but you know i'm very grateful and Thank you, Eric, for inviting me. <laughs> and, and you know, we're very honored to have your work here because, like I said, so far it's resonated with a, a, a lot of people from not only local people, but it's been you know viewed by people from the other side of the world. You know, in Kosovo, we, you know, so it's been it's been great having your work up, and you know, we're very thankful that you agreed to do exhibit here with us at the Building Art Museum. So, thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Eric. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, not that I can think of at the at the moment. All right. Well, thanks, Sandra, and uh, uh, thank you for taking time with me today and doing this interview. And uh, it'll be able to be seen on uh, our YouTube channel, and we'll link it to our website and also our Facebook page. And um, also note that uh, we are planning to have a closing reception on December eighteenth. Uh, and I, I will be there. <laughs> oh, you won't. I okay. will. Oh, but okay. I will be there. I will be there. <laughs> well, good. Because I'm bringing people with me. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mark no, I've already. 
Yeah. yeah I've so already told my friends. So some friends are coming out to visit the Blandin and <laughs> I'm looking forward to meeting some community members. Yeah. Fingers so, crossed for good weather. Well, and it'll be really great because it'll be really our first uh, reception since COVID. I mean, we had a soft one, but this will be the first like full one that we're going to be doing. So um, I think it'll be really great. So thanks, Sandra. Thank you, Eric. Have a good rest of your day. You too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>